This is the story of, well, eight planes. And no, the title isn't clickbait. Eight planes were actually involved in this incident. Usually, when you start reading an accident report, you have this section where they talk about the planes involved. In most cases, it's like one aircraft. Here's all the info about their aircraft. And then maybe in some cases, there are two aircraft. In this case, it just keeps going on and on, all the way from one to eight. Let's meet our unlucky contender, shall we? Plane number one was flight 1018, a TAP Air Portugal A320 flying from Lisboa to Madrid. Plane number two was flight 8825, an Air Nostrum Bombardier CRJ600 flying from Turin, Italy to Madrid. Plane number three was flight 54, a Ryanair 737-800 that was flying from Dublin to Madrid. Plane number four was flight 99, another Air Nostrum CRJ600 flying from Alicante to Madrid. Plane number five was flight 36. It was an Iberia A320 flying from Birmingham to Madrid. Aircraft number six is flight 290, another Ryanair 737-800, this one flight 290 flying from Birmingham to Madrid. Uh, what number are we on? Oh yeah, number seven. That is flight number five, an Air Europa 737 flying from Arrecife to Madrid. Finally, we have aircraft number eight, which was flight seven, which was an Air Europa A330 flying from Milan to Madrid. Phew, we're done with that. Eight planes all coming into Madrid, and they're all about to get very close to each other in a very bad way. So, it's the 27th of May, 2018, and Madrid airport was having a very bad day. It's about half past eight, and up until this point, the airport was in a north configuration. Runways for takeoffs and landings are selected based on the wind conditions at the time. In the north configuration, the wind will be coming in from the north, so planes will want to take off in that direction. At Madrid, when the airport was in the north configuration, it meant that planes would be landing on runways 32 left and right, and taking off from runways 36 left and right. But a bit past 8.30 p.m., the wind suddenly changed, and seven of the eight planes that we were talking about before all had to go around due to a shift in the direction of the wind. This sudden shift in the wind direction also meant that the airport had to change its configuration. Using the earlier configuration of runways would no longer allow planes to land into the wind. So the airport shifted to the south configuration, where runways 18 left and 18 right were used for landings, and runways 14 left and 14 right were used for takeoffs. It's basically the opposite of the north configuration. A while after the go-rounds, all seven planes had been vectored into land on runways 18 left and 18 right, as the configuration demanded. The first two planes to land were the TAP A320, that is flight 1018, and the Air Nostrum CRJ, that is flight 99. The A320 had been cleared for runway 18 right, and the CRJ on runway 18 left. As they both flew their approaches, the A320 was flying at 240 knots, and the CRJ at 250 knots. Both planes had been instructed to slow down to 180 knots. At this point, they were 1.3 nautical miles apart, but they were starting to come together. As both planes began to slow down for the landing, they both started to get uncomfortably close to each other. At first, they were 0.9 nautical miles apart and vertically 900 feet apart. Then they were 0.8 nautical miles apart and 200 feet apart vertically. This was well below the required 2 nautical miles of separation required when landing on two parallel runways. But as time went on, the distance between both planes just dropped and dropped, but they both landed safely before they could get any closer. Thank God, disaster averted, right? Oh, far from it. At this time, two more planes were lining up to land on runways 18 left and 18 right, Ryanair Flight 290 and the Air Nostrum Flight 8825. The Ryanair 737 was landing on runway 18 right, and the Air Nostrum CRJ was landing on runway 18 left. Like before, both planes were adequately spaced when the landing sequence was started. They were 4.1 nautical miles apart. But, like before, both planes were asked to reduce their speed. The distance between them continued to shrink. Within seconds, they were just 1.9 nautical miles apart, 
and 600 feet apart in altitude. That separation just kept falling. Soon they were 1.4 nautical miles apart and 500 feet apart in altitude. At their closest point, they were just 1.2 nautical miles apart and 600 feet apart in altitude. But before they could get any closer, both planes landed safely again. As that was happening, the next two planes were lining up for runways 18 and 18 left. This time it was Ryanair Flight 54 and Iberia Flight 36. The Iberian A320 was already on the ILS for runway 18 right, as the Ryanair 737 was lining up for runway 18 left. They breached that two nautical mile barrier and got too close to the A320. In an attempt to separate out the two planes, the controller asked the Ryanair jet to slow down to put some space between the two planes. But the thing is, the Iberia A320 was also asked to slow down so that it wouldn't get too close to a plane that was in front of the A320. But it wasn't working. Like before, the distance between them started to fall. Within minutes, the distance between the two jets was 1.3 nautical miles. Then it went down to 1.1 nautical miles. And at their closest point, the planes were just 0.9 nautical miles apart and at the exact same altitude. Before they could get any closer, both planes again landed safely. But we're not done yet. After that, Air Europa Flight 5, a 737, was lining up with runway 18 right, and Air Europa Flight 7, an A330, was lining up with runway 18 left. At this point, you know the drill, right? The controller saw that both planes were getting a bit too close, and so the controller asked Flight 5 to reduce its speed and for Flight 7 to maintain its speed in an attempt to maintain separation. But despite the controller's best efforts, both planes still got way too close, at one nautical mile to be precise, and it did not increase. Both planes continued to close the gap till the moment they both touched down. Oh boy, that was a wild ride. Four separate air proximity incidents in the span of a couple of minutes. Any one of those incidents could have been a video on their own. The question is, why were these incidents such a big deal? It's not like they came within spitting distance of each other. Well, the answer comes down to two things. These planes were flying very fast, and so even a few miles or kilometers of separation can be eaten up in a very small amount of time. More importantly, it comes down to wake turbulence. If you don't know, a landing plane leaves a ton of turbulence behind it. The larger the plane, the stronger the turbulence is. If a small plane were to get caught in the wake turbulence of a larger plane, it can and has caused incidents. For example, look at Air Canada Flight 190. It was at cruise and it had very severe control problems with wake turbulence. Imagine something like that happening very close to the ground when a plane is about to land. That's why these separation standards exist, and that's why it's absolutely incredible and borderline unbelievable that those standards were breached four times, one after the other. But why though? We need to look at the decisions made before these conflicts to see why this happened. The investigators think that a wind shear event occurred at 8.47 p.m. This was due to a convective current. The controllers at Madrid talked to the controllers at nearby airports to see what they thought. Since they didn't expect the convective current to dissipate for another hour, they decided to change the configuration of the airport. This called for a massive reorganization of the way traffic flowed in and out of the airport. This change was made very quickly, and that immensely increased the workload of the controllers in the Madrid TMA, or the Terminal Control Area. Documents suggested that it would take up to 10 minutes for traffic flow to return to normal after such a change. But what kind of weather information did the controller supervisor in Madrid have? Making a decision like this requires very accurate weather data. They had access to METARs and TAFs, but these are hyper-localized weather reports. They pertain to the airport and a few miles of area around the airport. The weather system that they were dealing with was much more broader in scope. As it turned out, it was very hard for the controller supervisor to get a bird's eye view of the weather in the entire Madrid terminal control area with the weather data that he or she had. So with partial information, he or she decided to change the configuration of the airport. 
It is in this chaotic environment that planes started to line up with runways 18 left and 18 right. In each of the four cases, the difference in speeds between the two planes bought them too close to each other. They were trying to adjust their speed, but it takes a while for the speeds to change, and in that time, the planes got way too close. The really incredible thing is that there were four separate breaches in a very short span of time. That is absolutely unheard of. Any one of these could have gone bad. What's even more insane is that the eight planes had 1,246 people between them. What do you think about this incident? Did you even know that something like this was even possible? On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is the least and 10 being the highest, how confident are you in air travel? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This video is one of the hardest videos I've ever made, so if you liked it, a like or sub to the channel would be amazing. If you want to watch that Air Canada video that I was talking about before, you can find the link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.